hi, hi everybody. Uh, for the KU students here, it's, it's really, really good to be back here. And not as a, na, na, a lazy person who's only waking up at one o'clock, as I would be as a student. And I went to the literature department where I missed all the classes, but really, really, really enjoyed my life as a student. And so it's very weird to come back as a professor where you're like, Oi, look at them sitting there, would I be here? Um, Yvonne was a student here, probably around just before me. And she'll share, I'm sure, her experience in her own way now or later. Um, of course, you, you have, you know, uh, people you meet who have mutual hustlers, like Prof here, who I met when he was a mixture of building his house in a car, coming to mutually harass each other about trying to make what was a really incredible and dynamic book come to life, which eventually came to life long past my own energies had imploded. I, I just want to give a small sense of how in that sort of 2002 time, you know, it's like, you know, you've been sleeping for a long time and then all of a sudden someone just paints candy, candy, red, blue, green, and light. And so everyone comes out of their bedroom and everybody decides all the stuff you haven't been doing. Those people who haven't cleaned their house in 40 years are cleaning it. Those ones whose house is too clean are throwing mud on the wall. That's how 2002 was. Maybe at the time you're not realizing it in that direct terms of democracy and opening of space as Prof has spoken about. That's how it felt. It, so it seemed to me that we are now here almost 10 years after. In a matter of a year, I met almost everybody I needed to meet who has been important in my life. Uh, as a writer, as, as an editor, as a general noisemaker, as a, as a little powerful bit of chaos thrown into organized systems, Billy will know about that, uh, and so on and so forth. And so I met Yvonne in a friend's house less than a week after I'd won the King Prize. And she was, I have, you know, me, you know, I'm, my job here is to release her secret baby photos. So uh, she came with a woman called Etsango Chesoni, I think, who's now the head of the Human Rights Commission. And they had rented, with no money, a house in a forest where they wanted to create this wonderful art space. And so I don't know, they heard about me, I don't know where they got my number. Me, of course, I'd never met any artists because you're all working secretly before things happen. So all of a sudden you're finding each other and you didn't know each other existed. So within that week, I met so many people. And she came there and they told me about Ishara. We went to see the place. I think, in fact, one of the young women she was mentoring was a student here, right? Who ended up going to do a PhD in Joburg as part of that revolution that started a whole Kenyan revival of thinking and producing out of University of Itwatersrand. That young woman was, at the time, being mentored by Yvonne. And so, can, how can we assist each other? Then, there was a meeting in Ali's garden over beers. Ali's idea is an editor, where Yvonne was there, Paselelo Kantai, the filmmaker, Judy Kibinge. Then also, weirdly enough, somebody who teaches in this university, Wanjiro Kinyanjui, who had made a film and had come back from Germany, and whose idea, in fact, to start a magazine came before even we had think, thought about Kwani on a mailing list that we had had. All those people were there. So I'm trying to figure out this woman out because she has that thing of talking flowery like, oh, Binyavanga flowers. <laughs> so, so, and then I'm like, okay, that's Yvonne, the flowery person. Then there was Yvonne, the librarian, who wears glasses. And when she looks at you, she looks at you and then she's saying, um, when I'm thinking about, uh, uh, and you're like, okay, so there's a librarian, she's very serious, she wears brown, and then the flowery person is always wearing flowing things that do like this. <laughs> so I'd say scene two. So she sent me, so we had decided at that time we are going to start a magazine, somehow we don't know how, we don't know how anything. So people are supposed to pitch work, so it's so editor of environment, so editor of geography, many things like those. And then Yvonne sent me 
maybe five short stories. Uh, they seemed kind of poetic prose short stories. They were all very powerful. There's never ever a time this woman has ever written a sentence that you don't think this is one of the best sentences I've ever seen. But I didn't really know what to do with them. They were in Togo. There were ghosts and things happening. I'm like, so I called her that night, and we were in a hurry because we wanted to produce the first kind. Well, at least it was a PDF or website. And I was being very impatient in the way that those times were impatient. And I said, give me something. I said to her, not in context of anything wrong with her story. At the time, it was because I felt I had some really good short stories. But I had not one that, you know, puts the hand in your stomach and makes you feel happy, like that. So I said, this girl has got some this language. Let me now provoke. So we are talking on the phone. I was eating credit. That was a cane prize money, <laughs> which I ate a lot of. And we talked for, I don't know, 40 minutes. And she was in the saloon talking about flowers. She was like, ah, ah. And I was getting more and more irritated because I'm like, do something. Like, Bigger than cookie was young, or bigger something, do something. So she said, Oh, give me a few days, I'll send you something. So, like, two days later, that's what you need to be afraid. <laughs> two days later, she says, Oh, I've sent you, check your email. I opened the thing. I was, remember, I was living next to a friend called Pasalelo. We went and stole that house that she had wanted to build Ishara. And we went behind her back and stole it and rented it because we wanted to live there with a friend. And so, Pasalelo was there. I read the thing. Me, you know, I don't, I'm one of those people who sees ghosts, like ancestors and things, but I had goosebumps here. So I went to Pasalelo, I'm like, okay, I just, just read this thing. So he read it, and he went. I sent it to Intone Jabe, then the editor of Chimurenga magazine in South Africa. He called me, and that's a man who doesn't like spending money calling. He called me that night, and he was like, is this woman francophone, where is she from? This thing is amazing. This is like the best story I've ever had. That story to now, I have just came back from Nigeria last week, met the latest Kane Prize winner, who told me the best short story that has ever won the Kane Prize was written by Yvonne Orr. So I'm not going to, I'm just going to keep it brief and say something. You know, for, you, there's no way, right, but for many different writers, for something I feel, and I know Yvonne feels in a certain way, you, found yourse you find yourself, those, all those writers, we were young and everything else, they were just, sometimes they were political, sometimes they were just drinking beer and then talking about paintings and the things they'll do. Sometimes political events force you to go away from the thing you're loving doing and then you have to creatively produce from within it. And you do so kicking and screaming. Because you, you want to be left with your flowers. I'd already seen once, I'd given her the draft of Kwani to read, and I saw her speed reading it. She read like five stories in like eight minutes, and I was like, you know she puts that face there behind, and then, but after PEV here in Kenya, she was in the middle of writing her novel. I was in the middle of writing a novel, and we were still saying, oh, I'm interested in learning about childhood. But of course, PV just came to the center of everybody's stomach, right? The book itself was already there in some ways, but a certain urgency entered that book. It entered my book, but me, even up to now, I'm still afraid of going where she decided to go with this book. Because books are, in their own way, the dangerous things. That people respond in one way to some event, some will take a gun, some will produce a, a, a book that will set off bombs in all kinds of places. And that one is one of them. So don't doubt, because that stepping inside that space that starts to say questions like, what happened to the law nation, right? And will Turkana secede, right? Or questions that if me, when I was trying to write my part and start to say, what if Kenya breaks? Is Kenya breaking? Will it? Can it? That I, my stomach can't say it. She entered in there from the first sentence into the broken promise promises that how they reverberate into secrets and families that date back to Mau Mau colonialism, little weird betrayals, betrayed friendships, torture, love, then the utter enjoyable thriller. Because now, you know, that's the problem as well. 
is even when you as a oh, that's also a thriller. Because then you're thrilled watching, you're horrified, you're remembering, you're feeling your own country. But then also all the way around that thing, and now it becomes terrible because every time I've just read this book or read that of it, I keep thinking that's the novel I should have written. So I want, it's almost like I want it to be mine. Is that poetry? Is that gone inside Trukana, taken? So, like the whole violence of what Nairobi means to us, the whole love of it, the streets of Nairobi are central, and then Turkana becomes the center of Kenya. And she makes it because that she really, really hears the poetry of people. And I don't even know whether she went to learn Somali or she went to learn Turkana because the poetry is there. Not just the poetry of landscape, animals, and so on and so forth, but the poetry of people, of interacting with a place and setting it in time. You move to the 70s, the 50s, the 60s, 2000s, and everything else. And it seems as if, for a time, you're like, Turkana is the center of Kenya. I must tell you that I am so happy, for me personally, um, that the moment, the spark of what Kwani became, my deepest personal feelings was the day I received Weight of Whispers in my inbox. And to me, to mark a full cycle of coming of age, of Kwani, is the launch of this book here, Dust Tomorrow. Everything else is important, but for my heart, that is it. Okay. Thank you, Binyavanga. Um, it's like hearing for the first time, thank you. In so many ways, thank you. Well. <laughs> okay, I'm a bit strong for a loop, but let's get on with this. Put yourself in courageous conversations with a cliff edge of your life. No matter how frightening it seems, Courageous conversation needs courageous hearts. I'm quoting David White. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, brother and sister students, and friends and family I'm seeing for the first time in a year. What a privilege, what a pleasure it is to start this journey here with you at Kenyatta University, the foundry and forge where at some point my mind and imagination were also shaped. I am a KU alumnus. <laughs> so being here before you is a kind of homecoming that only the fates could have arranged. I'm also struck by the odd confluence of Kenya's 50th, Kwani's 10th, and the launch of the novel Dust. The expectation was that I would speak about my literary journey, but I thought given everything, we might talk about that later in a more open way. And this paper and this presentation focuses on the humus of story, the imagination, and its connection with a, a lot of things, with words. And quite frankly, um, I'm just curious how many students are here, actual students, just what reason? Oh, great. And um, how many of you are nurturing in secret corners stories, poetry, or good? Yeah, okay, and I, I noticed those who put their hands behind me. <laughs> I was one of you, I was one of you. In many ways, this presentation is um, directed at you. Very briefly though, about personal literary pathways. First of all, let me say that it's an ongoing journey. In far too many ways to mention, it's always just starting. Secondly, in this journey, there's no arrival date. There's no place to say, I have arrived. I have not arrived and never will. Not if I want to continue writing, which I do. But again, we shall discuss this later. So let's begin. <coughs> Quoting Joan Didion, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. 
Professor Dan McAdams, author of The Stories We Live, Personal Myths and the Making of Self, observes something we know but rarely articulate or explore, something that we need to own deeply for ourselves. He says, we are all tellers of tales. We each seek to provide our scattered and often confusing experiences with a sense of coherence by arranging the episodes of our lives into stories. We are not telling ourselves lies, rather, through our personal myths, each of us discovers what is true and what is meaningful in life. In order to live well with unity and purpose, we compose a heroic narrative of the self that illustrates essential truths about ourselves. Have you ever wondered where story comes from? Have you ever wondered about the main story that governs your choices? Kenya's choices, its dominant themes, the ones that recur over and over again, as in a cycle. Do you ever question the whys of this? Have you ever wondered about any of the, have you ever been suspicious of invented traditions, rearranged myth, and false nostalgia that you're expected to subscribe and believe in and sustain? Have you ever asked yourself what other strands weave into the book that is Project Kenya? Or Project Yourself? Why bother wondering, you might ask. Quoting Mike Adams again, a personal myth is an act of imagination. Imagination and its contents or discontents is what I'm on about this afternoon. I do not ever remember a time in my life without stories, without reading or hearing stories, without being encouraged to read and tell stories at home. Our home was filled with books. At school, I was a struggling student, finding difficulty with most subjects, except English grammar, literature, and composition. One day when I was in Standard 4, a doorway into the wonder and mystery of the, of the maths I was terrified of slipped open. A stand-in teacher entered our young lives for just a week. And when she presented geometry or angles or fractions, she sang them. She pointed to the angles of constellation. She turned, uh, she turned them into characters in a mathematical play and helped us, especially the small frightened ones such as I, escape the terror of the dry facts of maths, turn this into a living adventure full of mysteries waiting to be encountered and solved. And then she left. And with, with her departure, the return of a stark drought of ceaseless cold facts, brutally delivered under the tyranny of dogmatic formula and rules, and those like me who had been terrified to begin with, retreated further into fear. But the sensation of the moment of magic and light that entered our lives, something that brought light into what was um, mysterious and fearful has never left me. In that moment, everything good and great was possible. To find an entryway into the mystery and myth that seizes our lives, your lives, mine, and drive our journeys, there are arguably four primary elements you need. One, you need questions. Question especially, and this is to the students, especially the expected, the dogma, especially in and of your life story. Two, the imagination and its different dimensions. Today, I will mostly going to refer to the poetical imagination. Three, space. To reflect, to create, to ponder, to dream, to be silent, to emerge. Four, another your audience, receiver, your mirror, your recipient. And this is as an aside and a message to those intending to explore the world of story. The questions are your gemstones. Every step you take begins with a question. The primary one being, what if? It is this that carries you into the realm of your imagination. As with most of the things one might imagine, one has first thought. When you set out to define those notions, you find that there are a million others who have been there before you. So, philosopher, Professor Richard Kearney, whose book, The Wake of Imagination, is a great reference uh, to you students, says, our creative imaginative power to shape and form 
um, what is the imagination? It's our creative power to shape and form and, f and figure. Um, let me read again. Our creative, imaginative power to shape and form and figure is a gift that can go in two directions. He characterizes the human imagination as a creative capacity that can be turned into both good and evil purposes. Also a capacity whose ethical dimension needs to be nurtured to make it responsive to others. Why should you give a damn? I quote from erudite Renaissance woman, and I'm going to put her on the spot, um, uh, scientist, technologist, thinker, scholar, African and dear friend, Dr. Sheila Ochuboju. For whom Kenya is a space of retrieving both her creative soul and imagination. She had said in an email to me, the visual tools needed by many are often inadequate to the task of reading African books. In the end, we need more windows in the word in. We need more windows in. The words must paint more pictures for us to understand the text. The prevalent visual clues that are easily available to, our, to us are mostly Eurocentric. They bombard our lives with images and texts that are often subliminally derogatory and contrary to the ideas and values we want to speak to. It's more difficult to compete for the attention of our youth, especially the emerging and growing cohort who look outside of Africa for what is considered cool. We may lose them forever if we cannot convince them of, co of the compelling narratives in our stories. And she also adds, our minds are capable of holding an exponential number of images and narratives and also hold contradiction quite comfortably. In addition to what Sheila suggests about the exile of generations from the African imagination and realms, imagination realms, because of the hemorrhaging of resonant archetypes, I am convinced, I have said, I've said this before, I am convinced that the main violence too and the most formidable blows against the African and Kenyan imagination are self-inflicted. I have in other forums faulted the public education choices which have not only neg neglected to educate, grow, and stimulate the imaginations of our citizens from cradle to grave, but have also contributed to the cultural imagination's suffocation, failure, loss, exile, and even more dangerously in some cases, its retreat into underground realms of some seriously sordid darkness. Over the years, we have drained our national lexicon of words or images that describe or explain our epic moments, our triumphs, our tragedies, our holocausts. Reading national texts like newspapers or watching the news or listening to radio, it appears that the country is stuck in a single frame of image, a single framed image and text. Most of our public characters sound the same, and even insult each other in the same way, usually with words appropriate from American rap gangster rappers. The outcome of a sustained neglect and assault on the Kenyan imagination is not an abstract or neutral thing. If the youth are not looking to other worlds where the imagination flourishes and generates new ideas and, project and products for better or worse, then we have, we're afflicted with a wily older generation whose distorted yet powerful presence and imaginations channel the restlessness of especially younger men. A decrepit age that steals the lives and destinies of the young who are lured, usually by the framing of a glorious imagined past and its repositories into defending indefensible things and being invited into acts of uncommon evil in the deeds that, are all, that also trapped this same older generation in the first place. The inciting older generation believing themselves to be archetypes also demand absolute loyalty from an unquestioning, disengaged age set who never learned or were ever allowed the responsibility of developing their distinct voice, their personal vision, or reflecting on templates of a life presented to them as reality. And I'm speaking to you, especially students. That perverse imagination plays out in our Kenyan spaces where, for example, you hear unquestioningly, unquestioningly, I might add, declarations against other Kenyans so that, I'm paraphrasing Kearney, the other, anyone who does not think, look like, or talk like a prescribed us, is evil. The other Kenyan is non-human, monstrous, diabolical, and therefore deserves to be excluded, hated, displaced, condemned, or killed. 
In a place where the space of critical self-reflection is eroded, since nature abhors a vacuum, the people in that space always seek someone else to blame. That is, they resort to the child's way of hiding from reality and responsibility. You know how children caught out in mischief and fear always try to blame something else. In our larger world, it plays out in the sustained slaughter of young men, convinced to be suicide bombers by powerful myth holders that have displaced the sense of a story of a compassionate and merciful God. The template feeds the energy of groups like, and I was being politically correct here because I could have also said uh, Baghdad boys or Mungiki. The template feeds the energy of groups like Al-Qaeda or Al-Shabaab. We can all collectively go <coughs> when we experience the horror story that young men who live out the personality of Al-Shabaab execute. But can we who are targeted also call forth a more potent, heroic, and resonant story that would challenge the one by which they abide? Can we? Yet how do we even begin if the fundamentals of story structure or learning the color of light or the placement of music are absent from national lesson plans? Even if these, other, these, are, other way, these are other ways of thinking, tools that bring personal light into darkness encountered on personal or communal journeys. Weapons used to exercise deep fears find healing for even deeper wounds and emerge with more profound questions and stories by which we can abide personally and as a nation. What happens if they're not taught? You want to hear what a selectively harnessed imagination is capable of? There was a man of Kenya who in 1959, age 29, conceived and implemented a nationwide airlift to the United States. Say what you want about Tom Boyer, but I defy you to name a single other Kenyan before or since who has ever revealed a vision for lifting up a whole nation without consideration of ethnicity and to carry over 10,000 men and women to access the best of knowledge and skills available in the world to prepare the nation he loved. The airlift was extended to six other African countries. Can you name another person who has done that in the history of Kenya in the last 50 years? The deed not only impacted Kenya's destiny, but America's as well. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what an ethical imagination can achieve. <laughs> McAdams would call Tom Boyer a highly generative person. He lived out, a person who lives out a story that gives life to many. A person whose story not only reveals his sensitivity to others' lives, sufferings, or dreams, but is also guided by a clear and compelling personal ideology, a compelling personal story, which entwined his destiny with that of Kenya, a man who had set goals for the future dream of Kenya, whose design of the Kenya flag is one of the mythic standards of each of our identities. When we paint our faces red, white, green, and black, we are painting into our lives the colors of a murdered patriot's dreaming. So for me, and questions of my Kenyan being, especially provoked by the post-election violence, I had to glance at the top. It's a topic I look at in the book, Dust. It's to understand something about a country, my country, that sets out to murder the best of its own. What kind of nation gets so terrified of a grand imagination? What kind of people annihil annihilate the hold of a persistent and transcending dream? Why? The book does not offer any answers. It does, however, suggest a desperate need for the collective imagination to restore a voice to ghosts such as Tom Boyer in order to exercise our national hauntings, all those ceaseless subterranean forces that hold our country back. Am I wrong in stating that as a country we have a, ter a terrifying tendency to lurch from one incomplete and painful episode to another? Without the relief of resolution or more, handing over uncompleted lives to the next generation and the one after that. We watch in bewilderment as our officially sanctioned madmen and mad women run rampant in public spaces, screeching one incoherent thing after another and conflating the country with their egos. We are shamed when we meet the broken reality of the myth we have owned and aware that it was doomed to break because it had purged itself of our personal best and deepest dreams. It can never be whole without each one of us. 
the book Dust, even though it unfolds in our post-election violent season, proposes that the seeds of the Kenya stories of unraveling start. When we kill and bury the people, our illusions and nightmares have murdered secretly and hope that they shall, to paraphrase a new Kenyan coinage, they shall accept and move on. Dust says they don't, and neither do we. Unless the, highness of, unless the offense committed against life itself is named, acknowledged, and atoned for, it builds on a theme that is also in Weight of Whispers and my other lesser known works, the source of life's question to Cain, the prototype human. Cain, where is your brother? The Lord then said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Remember what Cain had said. He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And that's a question I ask. Am I my brother's keeper? I'm exercised by the question of all our Kenyan ghosts and why we keep making these ghosts. Why are we unable to tell stories that resurrect and enable the collective to apologize to them and to each other so that we might find our way to real peace? Why are we more willing to suffocate the whole country in order to silence the wailing? And why so many of us willingly collude in the silence? I am, I am one of the accused in the collusion of the silence. Why do we choose amnesia and not wonder why we are needlessly and endlessly restless? Back to imagination. I'm convinced that the primary African and Kenyan crisis is the crisis of imagination. The arts, the locus for the education and stimulation of the imagination has been eroded and then leached out of national school curricula. It's it was depressing to learn last year that the composition exam standards in the country have fallen so far that some teachers are just grateful to be able to read one almost sentence in English. But if a citizen cannot construct a coherent worldview, how will they situate themselves in the world at large? With all the assorted voices coming at them, the loss of an educated imagination means that in the narrative life of our nation, we have been unable to retrieve or create words to contain our suffering or our glory or to offer these names, images, and a lexicon and, process, and a process through which they are purged or understood. In the end, we are cursed with bloat-headed individuals who imagine that heroism is an, is an acquired enterprise that ill-gained money bestows on a person completely unaware that they are making the mistake of the naked emperor who flashed his buttocks to his pub people, imagining, and the unharnessed imagination can be tricky that way, that he was adorned in exquisite gold robes. For those of you who have time and need some comic relief, please study our new governors and analyze their evolution of manners. <laughs> study our daily newspapers, the news, witness the anemic African Union cycle of narratives. They are never they are never one of the power, they, they're never one of power or of, or of capacity or creative agency about anything. But boy, can they do victim brilliantly. Never mind that they are trustees of the wealthiest continent on the earth. The imagination. Every child is born with the seeds of a mythic imagination. And with the splendor of our Kenyan spaces, the triumph of the image of species that share our human lives, you can be sure that the Kenyan personal and collective mythic imagination would be superior and grand and compelling to all the world. Every child requires the mythic imagination to evolve a unique, powerful, personal story by which they will, they will live. Every child imagines him or herself without a problem as an astronaut, Superman, Shaka Zulu, that was my little brother when he was four, a policeman, a teacher, something with a heroic identity. As, as, an, as, an, as an aside, I was going to say the idea of heroism is in our human and national DNA. So yes, as a collective, we are wounded when the ideal of the image of our warriors, our KDF, was sullied by images of them carrying Nakumat plastic bags and performing the archetype of the common thief. The shock to the psyche will not exit the collective, the collective, no matter how many decrees and commandments are passed, unless a process, a kind of ritual of atonement of, or reparation is undertaken. As I was saying, every child has a mythic imagination, but every dreaming child also falls into the hands of adults, parents, teachers, even priests, who will proceed to squeeze it out until they have molded a perfect clone, repeating the same foolishness that has sustained a particular mediocrity and inability to rise beyond the mundane. <laughs> we cultivate a generation of productive robots who, yes, produce extremely well and with global competence, 
but who dare not dream of finding new stars, who have been taught to mistrust their dreams, the space of power greater than any oil find. They're allowed to imagine that the stars are there to be reached by others. They do not know or have not been told that you can reach, that you can reach new stars, name them after your mother when you imagine and write a story called Star Wars and film it. You can reach those stars by inventing a spaceship called Voyager or even by imagining, um, imagine, imagining building the Hubble telescope and creating an infrastructure of minds that gather around a great vision. Your, your imagination innovates high value products that create global economies, things like the iPad, your iPod, and your iPhone, because you were taught from the day you wailed your way into life that your but with your imagination, all things are possible. You just need to tell yourself the story of the possibility. At the heart of every piece of art is a story. At the heart of every innovation is a story. Every dream is powered by a story. The life of a country is the story its citizens tell about themselves and each other. It is in the personal and collective imagination. This, the imagination, ladies and gentlemen, is at the heart of a plea for securing the arts not only as a teaching tool, but as a resource of national growth. This country, I believe, has an exceptional mission for its people the life forms within it and the world. The evidence is in the wealth of our diversity, which anemic imaginations have turned into threat and fear. We are asked by a ridiculous bunch to be afraid of each other, to reduce ourselves always to the smallest unit of communal being, the thing called tribe, even while we share a life space named Kenya. The evidence of the grand summons is in the wealth and diversity in our environment our flora, our fauna, our landscape, eight different ecosystems in this small Kenyan space is a wonder in itself in the world. But so fragile are our imaginations that we do not even glory in this. We are unable to see that every, everything points to a nation invited to a spectacular destiny and purpose, but which for so many unstated reasons, it consistently sabotages. In the story of Dust, the female character, Ajan, is con one, one finally confronted by the horror of the hidden national realities revealed through her brother's death. In the book, she stutters. It's a kind of speechlessness to mirror our own national silences. She uses painting to draw and call forth new Im images and stories by which to live. And when her father, who has lost his own capacity to believe, finally understands that this too is a way of thinking and being, he then asks her to paint her way out for the family, and while doing so, to image forgiveness. For everything that debilitates our hopes, we also have solutions that are resident in every imagination in this land. Here alone, there are how many? A hundred possible solutions to ending Kenya's impasses. But we dare not do this because we are frightened of transcending dreams and hopes. We call them impossible. And in killing the imaginative life of citizens, we have created a great chorus line that hurry in front of a vision to scream, no, never, it cannot happen for all these reasons. It requires heroism to be able to do what Jesus said, have faith to move mountains. For this enters the realms of the mysterious unknown. We are nervous because what if the mountain really moves? We also don't do it perhaps because we know that to question the norm is a daring and dangerous thing that sometimes asks for your life in exchange for a greater good. Because we have excused ourselves from the treasures that delving into the realm of imagination offers, we've also excused ourselves from creative contemplation of the dark, mysterious aspects, which is a part of life. Thanatos, the death, we experience the death we create. You who are about, who are in this university, some of you are about to graduate, have you been prepared for the seasons in life when everything will fall apart and everything, and even meaning, will taste like ash. It'll come, you know. But pre preparations for this demand a plunge with light into the realm of the imagination. But with this example, you do understand why sometimes it's easier to live with questions rather than enter those unknown spaces to seek answers. Kenya is older than 50 years, as you are so well aware. 
its name and future, the one we inhabit, came together in the imaginations of some unknown British Imperial British, Imperial British East Africa Company man, whether by will or destiny. It does not matter now. Here we are, mostly Kenyans. The outcome of a single distant imagining, even when we deny it. And no matter what, it is sound, or, 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 or no matter what, it is futile to try to take that away. We are living that vision, whether we like it or not. Ladies and gentlemen, what have you imagined lately? What image, idea, future story has shaken your life and lifted it up and perhaps planted the seeds of a country? Kenya celebrates 50 years of independence and self-determination. Congratulations, Kenya. But you, how do you experience yourself in the Kenya storybook? Is it a love story? Is it a horror story? Is your Kenya the one of hashtag we are one? The one you vicariously lived through the rugby seven pitch? What have you imagined lately? What and where is your story within it? And how do you express or how will you express it? A quick segue into the Kwani story and the imagination. Kwani proper started in the garden of the editor of East African, Mr. Ali Zaidi, on the occasion of an event he had hosted to honor Binyavanga for winning the Kane Prize. Many of us who had crawled out of our closets sat there in awe, marveling at the idea that a Kenyan had managed to leap over the gatekeepers to reach the world with a story that resonated with us and with my generation. But I also remember us complaining around that fire to Binyavanga about the gatekeepers of manu manuscripts submitted and lost, of the demand that we must we portray the village witch doctor and the goat, of works criticized without being read, of being accused of being an African or too urban or too elitist or too something, anything that ensured that nothing different would emerge to challenge the idea of what a Kenyan or African story was. Oh, we complained and complained, which by the way is a weaker way of questioning, until Binyavanga snapped and I'm paraphrasing his words, F this, there are no effing excuses for self-complacent mediocrity. With so much to do, what's the point of all this hot air? Technology has opened the frontiers and the world is there for us to redefine. We conquer the world by our imaginations because, it offers, because we can offer to it universes that it has never imagined. We don't have money to print a magazine, but we have the internet. And the primordial Kekwani, a space, appeared as an online publication. It launched with Weight of Whispers, which propelled me kicking and screaming into the literary world. Kwani Trust became the space where many of us felt safe and challenged enough to re-engage our dreaming selves, our hidden imaginings. The book Dust is a consequence of this wandering and wandering, and offered to you as is my standing here with you, now ending this monologue in anticipation of a wild discussion. Thank you. <laughs>